This is lecture 9. We're going to start a new topic, God Stuff, Philosophy, Religion. This is based off of pages 321 to 328 of your textbook. That's uh, chapter 4, the first section that they helpfully title 4.0. And in this particular lecture, we're basically just going to set up a lot of what we're going to be discussing throughout the rest of the semester. Mainly it's going to be an overview and then we'll talk about particular positions you might be able to take on the God issue, whether there's a God or not. And we're going to try our best to do a little bit of defining God. All right, so we're now turning to the philosophy of religion. The big bad question in this topic is obviously, is there a God? Does God exist? Are there gods of any type? Um, and as the book talks about at the very first page, um, this is a yes or no question. There either is or is not a God. This is one of those questions where there is a fact of the matter. Either the world really does correspond to the claim there is a God, there really is a thing out there called God, or there isn't. Um, and as the book describes it in that first little excerpt, either God is real or... God is a fictional, imaginary concept in the same way we imagine Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy or Tony Soprano or any type of um, various fictional entities out there. So God is either fact or fiction. And that's the big question out there. Well, in philosophy of religion, there are two related questions that we want to ask ourselves. Since philosophers are obsessed with rational evidence, seeing if you can come up with good reasons to support your belief, one first question would be, well, what rational evidence is there regarding God's existence? Is there a lot of evidence that suggests that there is a God? Is there a lot of evidence that suggests there isn't a God? Is there enough to conclude one way or the other, either that there is a God or isn't God? By the way, throughout a lot of this, I'll refer to a God singular. Um, I'm just being lazy. If I were fully um, um, robust, I would say God or gods each and every time. But I'm just being lazy. And to singularize it is a little bit simpler. So, um, In this particular course that you're taking, we're going to study two arguments for God's existence. Uh, they got fancy names, the cosmological argument, we'll be talking about that the very next lecture, and the design argument, we'll be studying that next week. And then we're going to be looking at one argument in support of atheism, and an argument that says that there is no God. Uh, that argument's called the problem of suffering, the book calls it the problem of evil. We'll be talking about that in two weeks. This other question, though, takes a bigger step back, and rather than just asking about whether there is rational evidence, this question asks whether we need rational evidence in the first place. That is, is it okay, is it reasonable to form a belief about God one way or the other without rational evidence? So maybe you might think faith, um, meaning the believing despite a lack of evidence is appropriate. Or maybe you think it's okay to believe not for rational reasons, but for practical, pragmatic reasons. And this is how the book kind of maps the landscape of types of positions you can have. The book describes the difference between evidentialism and non-evidentialism. Page 323 is where the book first mentions the word evidentialism, and on page 325 is where the book mentions non-evidentialism. If you're an evidentialist, you believe that any belief about God is only reasonable if it's supported by rational, objective evidence. In fact, you believe that for anything, not just on the topic of God and religion. You think the only way to have a reasonable belief is if you have it supported by rational, objective evidence. That's the kind of, object, uh, of evidence we've been trumpeting throughout this philosophy class so far. A non-evidentialist, on the other hand, says it's actually okay to believe stuff about God, even though you don't have rational evidence. Maybe you have some other kind of non-rational evidence. But a non-evidentialist simply says, rational evidence supporting your beliefs about God isn't required in order for you to be counted as reasonable. You can be fully reasonable if 
you believe something about God, and you don't have rational evidence. Well, let's look at evidentialism first and look at the various types of positions you can take as an evidentialist. Remember, an evidentialist, nice easy word by the way, thinks you need good solid evidence to believe whatever it is you do. Um, intuitively makes sense from the start. An atheist is someone who says we need evidence and there is enough evidence to conclude that there isn't a God. Someone who says there's no God and I got the evidence to prove it. The opposite side of an atheist would be theists. Theists believe that there's good evidence that shows that there is a God, that there are gods. God does exist. This might be a little bit less of a familiar term, theist or theism, um, but you can see it's just the opposite of atheism. A meaning without or not in this case. Um, there is a third position under evidentialism. This is the um, often ignored uh, position of being an agnostic. This would be someone who says, yes, we definitely need evidence, but we don't have enough evidence, or the evidence we have is um, offsetting. It, it balances each other out. So the evidence, evidence is currently inconclusive. We definitely need evidence, but we just don't have enough one way or the other to sway us to believe that there is a God or that there is not a God. And just a reminder from our last section, we refer to agnostics as religious skeptics. Note the difference here between an atheist and an agnostic. An agnostic will just shrug her shoulders and say, I don't know. An atheist will say, no, there's no God, it's all BS. All right, so non-evidentialism, let's talk about the other side of this issue. This is the, um, the uh, uh, theory that you don't need rational evidence of any kind. And there are a variety of types of non-rational reasons that the book lists starting on page nine, uh, 325. Why might you believe that it's okay to believe there's a God, even though you don't have good, solid, objective, rational evidence supporting your belief? Well, you might consider subjective personal factors, like a unique personal experience that you have, or a series of personal experiences that you have, that aren't really shareable uh, objectively. They're not the sort of things that you can impart using testimony, um, using the normal sorts of ways that we impart knowledge to other people. There's something unique about your experience that suggests there is a God. Maybe you're concerned with faith, and there's one particular type of definition that makes faith in tension with reason. The idea of faith is this belief despite or perhaps because you lack evidence. Uh, supporting that particular belief. You believe anyway, and you think it's important to believe, in some sense, as a matter of trust. In some sense, because you don't have enough evidence, it's important to take that leap of faith and believe it anyway, to put your trust in something that you're not entirely sure of from a rational perspective. A third type of non-rational reason would be a practical reason. We're going to be studying an argument for this our very last week of the semester. Pascal's Wager says, you should believe in God because it's in your interest to do so. After all, if you believe and there is a God, you can go to heaven. That's a pretty good reward if you're a self-interested person, if you care at all about yourself. It's practically beneficial to believe in God.